So my plan today was to make uh, those envelopes and gift boxes again. But we can, I think all of you all have done those, no? Everyone has done those. So we don't mind doing them again. Yeah, all right. Let's do that again then. So let's get um, two sheets of paper. Uh, you can use the uh, papers from the back of the drawing book. Or even if you want, use uh, used paper. At least for the box. Because the inside gets completely covered. So you don't need fresh uh, paper at any time. And if you've got uh, maybe brown paper bags or something. Or old bags that you want to use up. If you've got bags that you've got design on one side and you want to use those, even those can be repurposed. I was asking those uh, Amazon, that whole lot of paper that comes through the Amazon packing. Ah, yeah. you could use that. So I, you know, this, this restaurant is there and they use this brown paper as a mat, as a placemat. So I just picked it up. From the restaurant, I said I will cover my book, but I didn't do it till now. But I thought I will cover for the book So you know the thing with papers is, um, uh, you can collect a whole lot of different papers and then bind them together. Uh, if you do this Japanese binding, so I'm gonna have a workshop end of the month. Do the Japanese binding technique. You can make. Uh, say a journal or something with all sorts of different kinds of paper in it and you should so there's a way in which these journals also become very they're like a tactile experience papers are folded in uh, some fold out and become a big thing you can have um, stickers pasted you can have other stuff put in in fact uh, you must have also come across these um, books that are made out of fabric so even when you have old pieces of fabric, you can bind fabric also in the same way. You just get the edges uh, finished and then you make, uh, you can, you don't have to puncture holes. You can just stitch the whole thing together and you can bind them into books. So when we think about books, often we think about just the standard white paper or ruled paper at best, all the same size papers. And uh, we don't expand the idea of binding something together into other materials. And if you think about it, you can actually, anything that can be stitched up can be bound and made into uh, what's called a codex. So any book who used to be called, uh, any bound object used to be called a codex. Um, so you can think of leaves sometimes there are uh, uh, what else is there you could make a book out of uh, even something like uh, you know they, they there's this thing called amba poli which is which is like leather you have fruit leathers by the way that's something that I came across some time ago uh, like they make jams of leftover fruit they, you can am papad yeah, so like a papad. Yeah, yeah I'm papad. Am papad. Uh, we, uh, Mango leather is what they call it. Correct. And mm. you make other fruit leathers also. So mm. it's mm. literally like leather. And it's meant to keep it preserved and you can have it even out of season. Um, so it, it, just think of a texture and you can put it together and make something that you would otherwise have done with paper. So uh, very often when we are thinking of, uh, th these are exercises that are done in design school. You sub substitute one thing with another thing and then change its application and you come up with all sorts of new stuff. And this is needed because um, obviously when you're doing um, design or you're thinking of solutions for problems that come your way, you want to find something more in innovative and then that will help you bring this um, uh, a solution in and that could be a completely different solution so I remember there was one time when I saw this documentary on how uh, origami helped in uh, NASA and one might think in school so we thought what is an origami artist going to do in NASA you need to be like a space scientist a rocket scientist but um, they used origami to fold uh, these foils which were going to go 
uh, in satellites, I believe, or long distance, uh, whatever shuttles they call, not shuttle, they don't come back. But they needed something that can be parceled in a very small size and then it's going to unfurl to an inhuman size and then propel that object away. So um, when you, uh, they could not think of a mechanical solution, but uh, when paper folding was brought in, they then changed that whole shield into something that was flexible and then folded it in a very complicated manner. And something that would open up into hundreds of feet could be compressed into something that was just a narrow flute. And then not just compressed, it has to also unfurl without knotting and all. Beautiful. If I find this, I'll, I'll share with you. It's a very short documentary. Okay, so let's get going. This uh, bookbinding thing, Aditi, you can do an online thing also no, for us. I'll try. So I'm going to ask uh, Roshan if we can do online. Uh, yeah. And then uh, maybe I'll just figure out the materials. Maybe we can ship materials. They're not very complicated. Uh, maybe we can do it when she's here. Yeah, that would be yes. nice. Yeah, that'd be very good. That way we won't miss out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly, <laughs> I'm feeling pained that it can be only uh, in person. But I'll ask her, it should be possible. Yeah, yeah. So not the paper making, of course, but uh, yeah. definitely the book binding. Book binding, be. yeah. Yeah. That'll help us with all your art and all that. Then we can bind our own thing. Yeah, it will. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm using, I'm going to try to use a thinner paper this time because the paper folds become very thick when we use drawing paper. I'm using this uh, 100 GSM executive bond paper, but you can use our drawing paper also. So I want to make the top and bottom. And since we've done this box before, let's think of a creative idea to put on the uh, design. Uh, of the box. It does not just have to be those roses. We can take this exercise a notch higher. So while we are making the boxes, you can think of multiple things that can go on a box. So I have this box and if we study this, you'll see that there is a top and a bottom. You have a flat surface, which is a larger area, it can be seen from, uh, from uh, more prominently. And then you have the side walls of the lid that are visible. Then you have an inside, which also has some folds. The same thing, but in a smaller size, so that when it is put together, you don't see the walls. But once the box opens, you do see the walls and the bottom as well. So if we think about all the different surfaces that we have, you can come up with a set of ideas that you can work with. Um, one could be fairly simple. You can start, a, you can write a poem or a line from a poem. Um, and then you can finish the poem on the inside. You can write the name of the author in the on the top or the back. You can write the name of the person that you're giving the gift to on the top. So that's one. There is something that is moving around. Then you could write uh, uh, a puzzle. You could write a puzzle such a way that it starts off from the top, goes around the middle. Then you have a third line and then you can't keep the answer at the bottom. So you have to find a way to put the answer on the inside, something like that. So if you can come up with something in the, in the time that we are making the box, then we can put that in also and I can show you some lettering about that. Now, since you're making a top and bottom, if you're working with A4 size sheet, we'll cut one sheet to 21 by 21. And then another sheet, just one centimeter short or less than even one centimeter is fine. Short from both sides. So it'll be a 20 by 20 measurement. Normally I dissuade using a scale, but today it would be good to use a scale.
Before you keep the scales away, just draw the cross. From edge to edge. Or corner to corner, not edge to edge. So if your paper has got a thick, a rough side and a, a smooth side, uh, choose which side you want the painting on. Sometimes painting or writing looks better on the rough side. Sometimes it's better on the smooth side. And if you're not sure, take the leftover paper and just write or paint a little bit with whatever you're going to use to decorate the box and then check which one would do. So I'm going to write with our regular uh, micron tip pen and uh, I'm going to keep the smooth side on top and the rough side inside. Okay, shall we begin? Okay, so all corners to the center. This is something I wish I could do differently. So my dad is uh, very well versed in Sanskrit. And he said that many of these things could be written into a Sanskrit shloka. So you don't have to draw pictures or anything. You can just remember uh, by saying the shloka. Like you might also put this in a form of a poem. Okay, open the flaps and if you are comfortable with this, you don't have to make a mark, but I normally recommend putting a dot at the intersection of the pencil line and the fold, just so you remember where you have folded and where you have to go. So each corner goes to 
the opposite end to the dot at the opposite end. So if you guys have done this before, you might, you won't need it. This would be for the benefit of those who haven't done this uh, but are not attending today. <laughs> yeah, Kareem. But I used to be so confused with this. A couple of times I did it. And after the first two folds now, this is what happens. And this, I'm sure everyone has fallen prey to it. If you don't have the dot, you get confused because suddenly there are two folds. And then you feel, okay, I have to just fold it over. And then this is a big mistake here. You don't need this extra fold. So one way to know if you're folding it correctly in the absence of dots is when you take this fold over, essentially you've uh, made this dot so that when you fold over there, this crease comes right on top of the line in the center. So when you don't make the dot, this is one way you can check if you're folding it correctly. This crease comes right on top of this center line. And with paper folds, it's really so painful when you made the wrong fold. You try to keep keep the paper very nice and clean and then you go and make the wrong fold. It's just it's so awful. All right, so now we've got four flaps. Aditi, I'm sorry, can you uh, explain the second one? I mean, this one I'm okay, but this one yeah. huh. I'm So what you've done is over here, you've done this much. So you, you'll you see that that fold intersects the pencil line on all four sides, right? So put a dot on that intersection. In the center of the line? Maybe? Just the intersection, wherever the fold crosses the pencil line, put a dot on that cross. Just to mark that because you have yeah. to take the opposite end corner and bring it up to the dot. Now the first time you feel like what is the big deal? So you will fold this and then you'll fold the next one. That's fine. And then when it comes to the, the third and the fourth side, its opposite ends have got two creases. And so that you don't get confused, that dot will help you to put to know exactly where you have to fold up to. Got it? Okay, good. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so it's clear. Okay, now after you've made those folds, we go back to the first round of folds. So we have essentially we have four rounds of creases to be done. This was the first one, first round. This was the second round. And the, for the third round of creases, we go back to the first creases. You will see you have some new lines folded over here. But on the other side, you'll see that you have almost like a hashtag. So in this folded form, you have to reinforce this crease onto this part of the flap, which is right now uncreased. So all we need to do is use these lines as reference and fold each side to the center and press it down. So when you do that, you crease up the little triangle in the center. It's not creased right now. We just need to make a crease there in line with the, the other two creases. Here again, just fold on this crease with the corners folded in and make this crease for the flap inside. And for each of these sides, open up before you move or fold the next side in. So Avoid doing this. Don't fold this and then on this on top of the other. Don't do that because your pieces will become very bulky and in the wrong place. The paper just looks very, very ugly. 
as easy as this design is, I have encountered one person who I think just did not have the ability to work with paper. By the end of this exercise, her paper was so bruised and so creased. So, uh, and this was an adult lady. I felt really bad for her. This is a learning disability that she probably never discovered about herself. And I'm trying to tell her and she just couldn't figure out what is the top side, what is the bottom side. And if you just look at her, she's a normal person like you and me. But when you give her paper in her hand, she was so lost. I just couldn't understand what was happening with her. All right. Now on the other side, you will see that we've got these creases, the hashtag, and we have these squares in the corner. Now we have to create a crease that goes from the apex of the inside square to the apex of the outside square. So we turn this around and just put your finger in between on the line where you want the crease, pull the two edges towards each other by just pinching them like that. Make sure these edges are well aligned and then just pinch a crease into the corner. This is how it's going to look. So all four sides will do the same. This is round four. So now you can see that the structure is ready. All the creases are in place. And now is the final assemblage. So keep your structure upside down with these flaps pointing upward almost like belly up position and take two opposite corners and unfurl them, open them completely. So when you look at it from the top, you see almost like a boat like shape. You have these two walls on the sides, which are ready walls. So you just pull them up and hold them in place. And on both sides, the top and the bottom. You see these triangles are almost acting like a hinge. If you put your finger in, you can pull the side up. So you pull this up and then you can take, you can press these triangles against that wall and fold it over, fold that wall over the triangles and insert it inside and lock it in place to create the third wall. Okay, you do the same thing on the other side. You put your fingers here. These walls are ready. So we are creating a corner. Pull the rest of the paper forward. Tuck in these two triangles and fold the paper over the triangles and press it in. So this internal triangle space will go to the base of the box and it will be ready. Aditya, can you repeat the last step? I'm sorry, I feel like that lady only. <laughs> Sometimes in the paper. No, I'm telling you, this is something that you will discover. <laughs> Everybody does not have the same kind of skills. No worries. So do you do you have this shape? Let me bring yeah. it back to this completely open shape. Are two walls on the side standing up? They are, right? Yeah. Okay. Now you see these, these two triangles. We, we just folded the corners. Now just pull them in. Do you see this movement happening? Yes. Okay, so pull this in, take your fingers back and pull the side in. You you already will have the outside wall. Uh, okay, so, so I don't have to have 
You just cover okay. over those two triangles. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's all. Now, these inside triangles will not sit flat in the beginning. Don't worry about that. Once you make the cover and you put it in, the cover acts as, I don't know how that works, some kind of science. Um, the pressure that the cover exerts on the walls or the top or something like that just keeps these two triangles in place. Right now, they might just be overlapping. So you feel that the base is not solid, but it will become solid. Okay, now shallow. Next one. Now, the thing to remember is if you are going to design something on top of this and it is going to require making a line all or, or making designs all over the place, then you should remember that this box does not sit like so. We normally think he, if I make a design on the center, my box will sit, uh, the top will be exactly like that. I've done it. I just assumed that this is how it folds. But that's not how it works. If you open up the box, you'll realize that the sides of the box actually sit on the diagonal. So if you need to make a design, just join the centers of the sides, like 10 centimeter or 10 and a half centimeter, 10 and a half centimeter, make a diamond shape. And within that, then make a smaller diamond, which will be your center. So if you're going to make a flower in the center, which has a certain orientation, upper niche, don't make it horizontal, design it on the diagonal. Yes. And the reason is, uh, sometimes you want to make the design before you make the folds. In all cases, you should not make the folds before because some papers, when they're folded and bruised, they absorb extra paint on the corners and that can look really shoddy. Okay, chala. let's move on. <sighs> So another thing also is that the size of your box is about one third the size of the paper you start with. Twenty one centimeter by twenty one centimeter paper will give you a seven and a half by seven and a half centimeter box. So not exactly one third, but thereabouts. This is step one, all four sides in. Before step two, make that pencil mark. Now step two, a round two. Corner to dot. Now for step three, fold the corners back to the center and then take these sides, folded sides to half point. Because you have this fold on the opposite side, if this folding of two layers of paper becomes quite easy. Now round four is bringing the corners in and pinching them. Okay. 
open two opposite corners and just assemble the box. This should fit perfectly inside the first box that we made. I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Uh, yeah. What part? Uh, I mean, I'm here. I, I was doing... Uh, so I could make the square. This is okay. Uh -huh. Open uh, open that up and make the dot at the in intersection. Yeah, I made it. Now take each corner to the opposite dot. Each corner dot. Done it? Yeah, just a second. Okay. Hmm. Done it. Okay. Now fold the corners right back in. And each of these sides, fold it towards the center line. Towards the center, I mean up to this part or full till the center? Full right up to the center over here. See, you will have this fold on the opposite side. So what we've done is, see, I'll tell you the logic. Once we have folded over here, na, this part mm. to the dot, we have created one crease here. Okay. Mm. Then when we fold the corner back over here, we want that same crease to oh, also one. crease this part. So that is why you just fold this again and automatically the inside part will get creased. Mm. That's all. And then, hmm. after you've done that, you make these corner folds. Uh, Then after that, open opposite corners. And then you can make these turn the walls inward. So the, these can also be used as open boxes to keep stuff in. You don't need to always have a lid. I heard a very cute riddle the other day. Um, let's see if you all can solve it. Or you might have heard this before. This was a lady at a talk show hostess. 
she i can't remember her name it will come to me very pretty famous english talk show hostess she had this young indian boy of course who was a brainiac and who knew a whole lot of words or he would memorize the webster's english dictionary or something like that ridiculous and he must have been four or some crazy age and she asked him uh, do you know all the words in the dictionary and he said yeah i know quite a few and then she said okay do you know the word which has the most bees and he is thinking thinking he said b okay i'm thinking and he said he said okay you you would probably go with the word baobab because it's got three bees in it and then he explained that it's a tree in uh, east africa and things like that and then she said you know no i i don't think that's the right word i think there's another word and he is scratching his brain he's saying oh my god i know the dictionary the what what is she talking about and then she said the word of the most bees is um, hive <laughs> and that kid was just thrown for a loop it was so crazy he just he said, guy. yeah and he I mean, has a four year old he was but he loved it then he was so uh, i mean he, he was rolling on the floor <laughs> that she got him so this is it could be something like that for example maybe if there are candy that are shaped like bees or something or you we can make up stuff and you whatever you're going to fill in the box you can make a very cool you can make a riddle out of that and uh, very good sitting na ritika yeah i'm happy this is first time it's fitting so well <laughs> it, the sizes have to be precise and then it, then it fits pretty well i think it was good i mean i used the scale and measured so i think the measurement was correct so it fitted very close i think there's one more thing you can do and i've seen this happen so sometimes when you need a box to fit like this Uh, very often jewelry boxes are like that where they would probably take a smaller box and insert it but they would keep its walls are taller you would keep it in such a way that it sticks up a little bit and then you will insert this so you will have um uh, maybe you will have let me put some tissue underneath it so there is some padding and then i have oh sorry not here inside this so the padding keeps the smaller box elevated and i can use the, another box so the bottom outside box and the top box so the same size they can be 21 cm and that sits like this so when you're opening this box you can open it without having to dig into and open it also so all you need to do is then keep some kind of tissue put uh, maybe paste it from the bottom and you get this box the the space is pretty much the same but you could it, use lightweight foam or something yeah i want to be like a piece yeah. of uh, the scrubber those foam scrubbers that you get just cut it to size in yeah but don't use anything that is uh, non biodegradable for a paper box ah. because eventually this will go into trash so you don't you, if you can keep it to paper mm. that's great you could also use the paper that you have i have left over you could make it into a corrugation so this folding back and forth Hmm. Make a shape out of that. This is very strong. So Aditi, you're saying two boxes would be twenty-one centimeters by twenty-one, and one the inside one would be twenty by twenty. Is Correct. it? Hmm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Because I find that when when we do this. Hmm. this sits very pretty yes 
but as an option uh, because here you have to dig your fingers in and pull out would you rather have something that sticks out just a little bit for the sake of conveniently opening it but because the walls on the second or smaller box are in fact slightly smaller than the lid chances are it's not going to sit like that uh, the lid would have sit perf sat perfectly if the walls of the smaller box were taller normally when they make these boxes they don't obviously go the, to this extent make a four uh, sided fold and what not triple the size of paper paper they won't waste so much so when we are making at home it's quite luxurious but because you'll make just about eight or ten you can make these when you reinforce them you can also use them long so that's another way of keeping your objects sustainable that they are not use and throw they're use and reuse and reuse before they are ready for the bin Last week, I was invited to the MIT College over here to give a talk on sustainability and design. Oh my God, I think I must have turned those kids mad because those poor chaps were completely caught unawares that uh, what I would speak about would hit directly home. I just attacked them, asked all of them. What other stuff? Uh, what stuff do you wear? Have you made an audit? How much of it is sustainable? And the poor faces, they just sank. <laughs> because the first question I asked them, do you know what it means to be sustainable? I said, yeah, yeah, of course we know. You have to do this whole re refuse, reduce, all that, the same three hours. And also they, knew, they thought they knew everything. But I was doing this also to test how much of what these kids probably have learned in EVS in school translates into action at home and very little bit translates into action. There you go. So this is a nice solution. Now we need to find a way to fit it. So this way, even the paper on the sides, which we had torn to get, uh, get bring, uh, create a square, even that will get used up. If you cut it to the right size, you don't even need to use glue. This paper will just find a way to sit in with it. And then I can put the inside box, the height of the paper, that's exact. And then I have a third box, which will go on the inside. So worst case scenario, when I pull this up, this box will come along with it. Chances are when you're holding the bottom box, you're also holding the wall of the smaller box inside. And the friction might be enough to keep your box down so without any glue any sealant you can create this and it's quite strong
All right. So how should we decorate this? Maybe we can do some interesting blue pottery design. Yes, that would be lovely. Mm. Let's look for some reference images. Do you have a blue ballpoint pen also? You might have, no? Yes, sir. We can make some details with the ballpoint pen. Okay, I'm just going to draw some simple flowers. Maybe make a simple design on the sides. Um, first with just some light blue color. Now, my paper is not watercolor paper, so it's going to be very uh, patchy, all of this.
Now let me go look for a blue pen. <laughs> Okay, I don't have a blue pen, but I found a blue color pencil. Well, you're making designs by hand also. Uh, remember, you don't, you're not uh, obliged to make the same pattern in all four sides. You can easily change it. I'm deliberately making the shapes slightly imperfect because uh, when well, my paper is pretty much compromised and even if I try to make perfect shapes, they're not going to come. So I might as well enjoy the imperfections.
Ah. Your leaves turn out beautiful, uh, Aditi. <laughs> Thank you. I think now I don't have to think about them. Yeah, it's like um, I think your muscle memory is like perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's also possible that because we do a similar shape in um, when writing letters, no? calligraphy, that it's, even if the shape is not perfect, you know how that, when the brush is moving, what you need to do to make it exactly the way you want it. That, I think, makes a difference. I think I prefer the pencil line better. Yeah, pencil looks, uh, I mean, because it's the pencil is blending very well, no? Yeah, but I will not give up. I think I'll do both. So I get a lighter line. Oops. In the Friday afternoon batch now, there are a few new students. Shivani is the only one who's the old student there. So I showed them how to make envelopes also and how to make these gift boxes. And he was speaking about an envelope exchange. So that's why I think Shivani asked for the form. So do, does someone want to take on uh, uh, coordinating an envelope exchange for the group on Art From Home?
isn't she doing it shivani i don't know if she can do it i have a feeling so this was for the benefit of the new students but they didn't know about this happening so she said we we do this often you can put your name in but she's not um, i don't think we are taking on a, a full blown envelope exchange like we done some years ago i think na no? where everyone had submitted their names and then we had matched them up or different people so something like that but unfortunately this time i won't be able to take it on it still is a certain amount of work and with the uh, with this whole flame thing i'm now spending my free time evaluating papers or submissions are you teaching there on a regular basis aditi i'm teaching there uh, for one semester right now i don't know how which course are you teaching i'm teaching calligraphy acha ye calligraphy and i've got uh, i'm amazed at some of the kids work they are really good and uh, because i was expecting most of them to just be doing this because it's compulsory they need the credits and being liberal arts the college encourages them to different to do different kinds of things so i think a good 60% are doing it very well the remaining 40% are just testing my patience <laughs> One of my nieces is studying there. She just joined this semester. Oh, okay. What is she doing though? Is she in the first? She must be in the first year, no? Yeah, first year. Ah, huh. so mine is the second year students, third semester students. <laughs> For third semester, I don't know how some of these kids have passed and gone to third semester. they are really dumb <laughs> i mean i'm amazed that they pass through school dumb in the practical sense oh. they may be good at some subjects but just so there's two kids i feel really sad for them i sat with them and gave them a lecture like a auntie proper auntie how are you going to do what are you going to do in life nobody is going to come and rescue you <laughs> all sorts of stuff you're always going to think of yourself as unlucky and then you will realize that it was your own luck you did it yourself to yourself and i don't think any of this matter to them they are both uh, lazy and they don't find the course uh, valuable enough and i totally get it in this day and age when i should be teaching them ai i'm teaching them forget ai all your submissions have to be by hand no computers no yeah computers. but it's such a difficult line to walk now this is yeah because one of my friends who was lecturer was complaining she said her second year ma students uh, submitted assignments and she said they were all uh, chat gpt because i could see that they were all similar with one yeah. line change here or there for effect yeah but she said essentially it was all the, just the same as the student she was like what do i do now what do i do I I don't know. We are gonna have. Yeah. Uh, while while the reality is there that this is going to come in, you know. I mean, it is it's, going to become. Yeah. So you have to uh, learn to live with it. But I don't. No, I think in that sense, then uh, being able to find the right information itself is also a skill. Yeah, Not definitely. Because- Yeah, so you may may as well build that into your evaluation system. That if you if this is the information required, what sources do you get it from, and uh, how do you make sure that it is accurate? And uh, those are the questions that you can ask them. Because I don't think banning it is mm. going to work. and it's actually pointless they should know this the whole point is new technology in colleges should be encouraged to find out more figure out how you can do this well you should be able to give a better paper 
And then you have to figure out how you, you're going to test them for application. But I think, you know, what many people or teachers don't uh, or will realize in time is their work will also increase. So normally when I do testing, I spend a lot of time in the evaluation process. It's not just submit it and then I'm going to correct it at home and uh, give you a grade. So I now when I sit and grade these kids' papers today, I'm going to... Um, I've get, gotten them to write their names in a, on a nameplate in a particular font. So I'm, um, I have to comment on that. So I have to tell them what they've done right or wrong. And it's easy for me to just say it, but I'm going to now write everyone's names the way they should have written it and then ask them to compare and then learn. Hmm. I don't know how many teachers do that in their subjects. In calligraphy, I have found that a lot of times, at least in, say, the um, IM Pith and all, when you send in your samples, they will always spend a lot of time in evaluation. So I find that is very valuable because, for one, you know what would be the right thing to do. Secondly, you also know that the person who is evaluating knows what they're talking about. Hmm. Not like our art teachers who half the time they don't know what they're saying. And if the kids, I have two students who have blatantly said that their art is better than their art teachers. So <laughs> <laughs> why would they be interested? That's a batch of kids that comes after this class. They are delightful. And I hope I'm hoping that I've caught them in time before they're completely disillusioned, thanks to the school teachers. So with creative fields, a lot of time needs to be given. I don't know in other fields if they can or it's not needed. It's very tough. Actually, Aditi, the interest in a subject gets developed thanks to the kind of teacher that you have. At least I experienced that. Mm. Yes, very true. Very true. Because I hated history because that man would just come and he would just read from the book. And oh. it used to be, oh God, it used to be such a pain. Mm. Whereas history, if it's uh, taught well, can be such an interesting yes, subject. It can be. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had a similar experience. I used to love my history teacher in school, but the one in college, oh God, she's such a bore, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All she would do is dictate or something. It's so boring. Yeah. It it makes a big difference how the teachers uh, the teachers yeah. really. No, and many times teachers themselves don't realize that they need to keep upgrading themselves. You know, I mean, you can't just use the same set of notes ten years in a line and right. And even when we talk about communication, the point is if you are, uh, you know, uh, transferring information in a very drawly tone. Yeah. I mean, the person has slept in the first 10 minutes only. Forget uh, going through the entire class. True. Oh, cute. Yeah, I think pencil was good. There was no need for pen. This looks really bad. Pencil just gives it a very subtle uh, yeah. feeling. Very yeah. Subtle. yeah, very delicate. In the past, when I've made these boxes, I have spent a lot of time on making the cover. And then I've kept the bottom in a colored paper. 
to match or sometimes contrast the design made on top. Even that looks very nice. Oi. So this is another thing that I'm hoping to bring back, um, letter cards, which is just an A5 size card that you can hold in such a way that it seals up, but you do a design on the front. So it is it is a card. You can write the name of the person in the back and send it. The sides are open, so you probably put it in an envelope and send it. I remember receiving a card like that from a French pen friend and I thought, wow, this is so cool. They have such lovely stationery, which they did at that time. This was in the early, mid-80s. Uh, I think now we also have just as good stationery, but we don't have these cute items because obviously nobody is writing letters anymore. So if we were to translate that same design to this, it's a quick thing. Um... I generally don't like flat edges, so I would maybe make a floral design in such a way that I can make some scalloped edges along the sides. So a large portion of the front is your design because you don't really need to make um, uh, write anything on the outside. However, if you feel the need to, you can always have more text coming in as part of the, it's like a, yeah, as if you're writing a postcard. And for this, uh, this also, I think we can use that rose mulling design, sir, because they're so pretty and quite easy to make. So when the design is done, you can cut along the edge just a little distance away. Okay, 
giving some kind of shape, anything other than just this flat edge. But you also have to make sure that the bottom edge is covered. The inside of the letter should not be visible. Here, of course, this edge can also be cut more finely. The best bit about these designs is if you, as always, if you want to make multiples, just go and get them printed from a commercial printer. So you get, you can spend a lot of time in making one detailed illustration and then send it out to multiple people with personalized messages. And you can also make uh, a small leaf or a small motif paste over here so that this remains sealed. So you don't have to seal the whole thing. And then you can repeat part of this on the inside also. So just a little bit over here. So as far as possible, I mean, I've seen that when it comes to de decorating things, it it's always unpredictable. Some of the best designs are pretty unpredictable. And always more exciting, more charming. So our typical mentality, I think uh, general Indian mentality that we're all prey to is Nobody does even this. <laughs> but I think if we find it um, somewhere to start saying, okay, I have never done this before. So let me try doing this. And then when you do that, you've done it. So you have to do something else or something more. I don't know how or if that will ever be part of our culture to do more than is expected, not just as much and be happy with that. Yeah. And I'm sure there could be more that you could do also. And then of course, there's the back. So if you want to write the name of the person here, then you can do something here as well. Maybe I'll send this to my daughter. Now we have someone to send letters to. Oh. 
Who did you inherit your love for art from, Aditi? Um, I would say it was my grandmother and uh, of course the encouragement of my parents. They would always, they, I mean, they spotted it early in life. So they would encourage me. But my grandmother um, would, so they stayed in Thani and she would go for a painting class right, right down the road from us. And uh, around the time um, my younger sister was born, I have a feeling that I was packed off with my grandmother just to keep me busy while my mom could look after my younger sister. And uh, of all the things in the painting studio, uh, so they would, over there, they would give me this slate and chalk to draw as a three, four year old, what more can I do? But I distinctly remember the smell of turpentine in the air. And I must, I'm pretty certain I must have gotten a little high because I loved it. And I thought this is not a bad plan. Kuch bhi karke, I need to be around this, <laughs> these smells. But this, that was also later I realized that it was all oil painting and turpentine and everything. But um, I would sit with her and sh she would occupy me with painting. Then my granddad would uh, collect old reports, business reports uh, or annual reports because they had great paper and he would tear out the good papers and leave them for me. So whenever we visited during summer, not just me, all of us cousins, I just landed up being the one who used them the most. And then of course, hog them. Um, so I think it was partly, and then also the fact that I was really terrible at sports. I'm a very, very bad loser. So I'd rather not play than lose at a game and I was also very frail so I was often the loser <laughs> I never won <laughs> so there were lots of things I think uh, that contributed and then nobody could beat me in art because you didn't need any physical strength so that's I think how I naturally gravitated towards it and the more I did it the uh, more I enjoyed it the better I became and found that this was one way that I could uh, hold my own. Yeah, it's when you give your children the freedom also to, yeah, you know, and not try and live your life through your children. No, no, absolutely. And with my parents, the, when they saw the spark, um, they we traveled to Europe when we were very young, and my parents insisted on going to all the galleries see this painting, see that painting, look at this artist. We went to a blue pottery painting studio in Holland. I remember that. And I thought that was the highest level of skill. And then after that, we would go to some lace making. And I thought that was the highest level of skill on the planet. So I was just so completely taken by uh, the European arts, mostly. I hadn't traveled in India as much. And that's, that's why your knowledge is pretty, uh, you know, you've got lots of knowledge on that front. I think, and also that knowledge is available. It's also well documented. Sometimes I feel Indian arts are no less, especially when you look at, um, I think some of the arts that I like, I enjoy are miniature painting art. And that is very well documented. They have schools and it's very beautiful. The other arts are so sadly neglected. I I feel really bad for the artists. They, they should be given so much more. Uh, the Their living conditions are poor. The studios that they work in are terrible. And their promotion is terrible. I remember going to Puri. And on the mm -hmm. way, we went to this town, which is supposed to be... Very, very lovely art. I don't particularly like it so much. I'm not going to hang it in my house. But the skill was insane. I would love to promote it. I would even have loved to do a session in it if I had the wherewithal. When I went there, I found it very impressive. 
Patra Chitra. We, we saw these Patra yeah, Chitra. Yeah, yeah. Very nice, very nice. And to think that these guys made those paintings out of old pieces of cloth, which they put some, um, maybe some stiffener so that they make it like canvas and they paint on that. Very yeah. nice. Very, nice. Yeah. very intricate. Very intricate. And the stories are so lovely. They're always Rama and Mahabharat stories, which I love always. The other places also, there's so much. There's lots of crafts. And if we had, uh, probably if we traveled within India, I might have been uh, enamored by that also. It's just what you see at what time and what uh, impress impresses you at that time. Actually, so, okay. when you're older, your childhood stuff keeps, you know, surfacing. So whatever That's... you, during your childhood or whatever you've been exposed to, Correct. you know, you just tend to gravitate towards that. Mm -hmm. I feel that our visual arts are really suffered. I don't know how much they're doing now, but uh, if at all we need a new like a revolution for visual arts or painting or art. I definitely know for art we need it. I keep, the other day I was telling someone, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's this student who is in the fourth year in NID. She is a, a friend's daughter. She is, um, she has this very nice project where um, the, she needs to make caricatures of different people and then she's going to put that on a card. It's a card. Those people have made some donations and each of them is going to get this card to take back home. So she came to me and said, I need to know how to make caricatures. Can you help me out? Now, I'm not much of a caricature artist. I can study it and I can think and I said, okay, come anyway, we'll figure it out. So I we did some illustrations and I was seeing how her hand was moving. Uh, and I asked her, okay, at NID, how much time did they spend in sketching? And uh, she said it was terrible. They hardly spend any time sketching, except the kids who are going to do animation. They do a lot of sketching and they do a lot of live sketching. But none of the other students land up doing as much. But she said, the worst thing is when she did pick up a sketchbook and started to sketch, she was sitting on the campus and she was sketching and there was a her own professor who was walking by or a professor who was walking by who came by and he looked at her sketch, asked her, okay, what class you are in? And she said, whatever, I'm in the third year or fourth year. He looked at her sketchbook and said, you're terrible at sketching. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> and she said that that was, I don't know why they do that. And she just stopped sketching. She said, I was so unmotivated to sketch because I did not want to hear this. Um, so she stopped sketching, poor thing. And then, so she told me that this is the culture at NID, that they beat you down. They want to, they do not give you any praise. And I've known of this also. I've forgotten this till she mentioned it. But they, in this whole uh, pursuit of excellence, they fail to reward even effort, I feel. Of course, you have to pursue excellence, but then the kids who are doing something, especially out of their own motivation, you can't you can't be so cruel to them. I think it's just terrible. How are they going to do anything more? So I told her, forget it. You know what? I'm just going to start an institute, a university of art now, because this whole mediocre art and submit whatever triangular mountains shit has to stop <laughs> <laughs> we've had enough the world has had enough of this mediocre art from us so, <laughs> she was very happy she said, please do i'll join <laughs> oh gosh okay so there we have it Almost a matching pair. So this could be a very nice series that you could make also. Like for my daughter, I have been writing 
positive affirmations on post-its. And every time she comes, I have been giving her this whole sheet of post-its. Now, I could write that in this as well, or I could just stack all the post-its in this, seal this up, and send it across to her. So, the in terms of creativity, I would think, try to push your boundaries and see what all is possible, what you've not done before. Try to do something and allow for failure. So, for example, if you want to write a joke or a riddle, on the box you write it you miscalculate it something goes wrong that's still better than not trying anything at all this is the most generic thing we can do so when you are short on time do this and actually you could also do um what susan does now maybe get the boxes folded make the creases ready and but carry those papers flat around with you so that anywhere you're sitting you can do some time pass you don't always have to do this in paint. You could just doodle some artwork also. You could also use black pen to make florals or whatever and then come back home and push out there. Susan's already doodled. <laughs> there you go. Wonderful. Very nice. Susan, if you see that box, then you know that you're uh, Aditi's student. <laughs> that is totally like they say, na takya kalam. Aditi chap. Long, long, long way to go. But yes, <laughs> marks I get for trying. Oh, definitely. No, no, marks you get for awesome. the end product also, not only trying. <laughs> cool. Oh my so, God, she's one of the most prolific people I know, Susan. Yeah. I don't know where she gets the time. Oh God. <laughs> I, I oh, suspect she has that uh, that uh, Harry Potter's clock. Really? Time turner. Time. Seriously? No clock. Just that life oh, is a by. pleasure to see her work. And the other thing yeah. is, I'm sure Aditi is really happy that at least one student. Seriously? <laughs> I get nervous. Like a serious student. <laughs> Susan makes me nervous when <laughs> oh my god she's raised her head I'd better better now I have to do something new keeps me on my toes <laughs> oh, actually in every yeah. class uh, uh, every teacher will say that there's one student who makes you run for your money literally that is true that is true <laughs> that's always good I yeah. look forward to only that one student that uh -huh. student uh -huh. makes me. Uh, keep the pace. Even in flame, I have that only one student. <laughs> Everybody else is just like, okay, just bare minimum. This one goes mm -hmm. extra. Hello. We'll catch up next week. Yes. <laughs> so next week, I uh, going back to florals, I want to do a little bit of detailed botanical work. Um, so I wanted to do this now because you can start making your gift boxes and uh, gift cards and whatnot and actually start sending them out to people this time. Okay. All right. Chalo. That peony that you've made, no, on that um, artwork that you put up on the video in that um, vase of flowers, there's a peony huh? in it. Oh, which one is this? I can't remember now. I will send you the picture, but okay. definitely teach us to make a nice peony because I just love that ah, flower. I'll do and, it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay. Chalo. Have a Thank nice day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.